All right. Nakabakalebu, do you all, Nakabakalebu Melissa, on behalf of uh, the California State uh, University here in Los Angeles, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome our guest speaker. Uh, today, uh, who's logging in from the beautiful city of Sydney uh, in Australia. Uh, for those of you who may not know, our uh, seminar or webinar, as they call it now, since we're doing it uh, digitally, um, is part of the celebration of the Asian American, Native H uh, Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month uh, here in the United States of America. So every May, uh, this very special um, uh, um, month is uh, celebrated to to remember yeah those of uh, Asian and Pacific heritage uh, who have called the United States their home and this is something that has been uh, um, celebrated for the last couple of years and it's really uh, an event that brings everyone together and for me uh, this is one way I would like to acknowledge uh, you know, those who have gone before us and those who have paved the way for us. And because my area of research is in the field of uh, museum and repatriation, I chose the topic of uh, uh, repatriation and museums uh, to be the theme uh, for this month. So this is the first time ever that I've ever done such a webinar series like this. And I've been really excited that a lot of uh, conversation has um, started uh, from uh, this engagement that we have done, uh, not only engagement within the US, uh, not only in different pockets of the world, but globally, uh, we are all connected. So for those of you who are here, there's a sister connecting in from Vienna, uh, from American Samoa, from Aukilani in Aotearoa, and also Melissa here in Australia, and there will be others who will be joining in later on from here in the United States. So, Vinako Vakalevo, and now I'd like to um, take the opportunity to pass on uh, the microphone to Melissa Malu, uh, who will be sharing with us a very uh, exciting, very interesting, very unique um, repatriation that took place uh, in Australia over to the Kingdom of Tonga. And uh, Melissa was part of this amazing team at the Australian Museum in Sydney for facilitating uh, the process of repatriation. So on that note, uh, over to you now, Melissa, and welcome again to this webinar. Um, um, and thank you for the opportunity. Uh, before I continue, I would like to acknowledge country um, and acknowledge that I am joining you from the Darawa country um, where I work, build community um, upon. I'm also uh, working on Gadigal and Darawa country. I'd like to acknowledge the elders past and present and acknowledge that this is Aboriginal land and it was never ceded. Um, I also acknowledge my privilege as a descendant of migrant parents um, that I am able, to, of course, to live, work, and create upon this land. Uh, my name is Melissa Malo, as um, Tarisi had introduced. Uh, my father is Fijian, Lawen, from Lakemba, uh, from the villages of Nukunuku and Waitambu. And my mother is Tongan, and um, she hails from the villages of Malapo, Holonga, Pelehake, and Tongatapu, uh, to Anuku and Vava'u ties to newer for all, and um, also from Ha'apai, Holopeka, Whakakai, and Pangai. Um, I have been in this role at the Australian Museum since late 2021, um, and the Pacifica team sit under the First Nations Division. Now, <clears throat> the First Nations Division um, was actually established in 2021, um, and as far as repatriation, um, we had to build, first of all, and rightfully, the Aboriginal repatriation team first. Um, and uh, especially because the AM is the repository for ancestors in New South Wales. So we receive and uh, repatriate um, nationally and internationally. Um, just providing a background so that you you do understand um, and that as I speak about the repatriation we held in Tonga, I think it is important to um, to first of all acknowledge that we are still new as a division in doing this. Um, it may not be the best practice, um, but this has been our experience um, and how we have engaged. We've got 1.6 full-time workers for repatriation. Um, 
And, you know, we really need funds, I'm sure, like other institutions for a Pacific researcher, which we are working with the museum to achieve more staff to research provenance um, for Pacifica. Um, what we have done is that we've been working through our engagement strategy to strengthen relationships, um, strengthen and you know establish trust with various active projects that we have in the Pacific. And um, in the past, the Australian Museum has done some repatriation, um, but this one to Tonga was the first under our new First Nations division. And um, as I mentioned, sitting under, uh, we do sit under First Nations. And um, yeah, we, we are working towards making sure it isn't the last and that there are more uh, to come. Uh, as I mentioned, the outcome of our engagement strategy with Tonga saw this first repat repatriation. And um, part of that engagement was engaging with different people um, from Tonga, elders, community leaders, knowledge holders. And of course, with uh, we were very fortunate to be able to engage um, her Royal Highness Princess Angelica Lakifuipekatuku Aho, who at the time was the Tongan High Commissioner to Australia based in uh, Canberra. Um, and she was able to assist and uh, help us with this project. Um, I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. Please bear with me. Um, so, as, as I mentioned, um, a lot of the work that went into um, our Tongan repatriation was actually the result of engagement at different levels that we had had um, with different peoples in Tonga and including Her Royal Highness. We're very fortunate that she took a keen interest um, in the fact that we had two uh, Tongan ancestors, so how we refer them, um, in the collections. And um, she sent us a letter, an official letter from the government and uh, uh, requesting their repatriation in 2022, September of 2022, which then um, we embarked then on the process of um, deaccessioning them because uh, they were accessioned as an asset of the New South Wales government. The Australian uh, Museum sits under the New South Wales government. And then the, the Talanoa um, with a community, um, the, pro the provenance research um, with um, our repatriation research took place and a lot of the research as well and, and Talanoa um, was conducted by Her Royal Highness with the, with the people that uh, she needed to speak to. Um, and then, um, when uh, all that was sorted, uh, it was requested uh, the, the time. And so that took place earlier this year in January um, for it to take place before we repatriated them. Um, now, one of the, um, the ancestors that we had in the, in the collection um, was from the island of Atta. And um, in this photo here, you see these are community members, uh, Tongan community members here in Sydney, and also um, descendants and uh, from the island of Atta. Uh, Atta has quite a painful history um, with regards to the Peruvian black birding um, and slave trade. And the it was a very emotional um, moment and uh, for these people as it was, they were very happy that um, the ancestor would be repatriated, but at the same time, it did open up um, wounds um, regarding their, their past history. So we have, um, many of them also traveled along with the team from the Australian Museum, which consisted of um, our director um, for First Nations, Laura McBride, our researcher, um, and myself, and then also with somebody with DFAT, we had uh, traveled to Tonga in January to return um, these two ancestors. Now, we were very fortunate, as I mentioned, of the involvement of Her Royal Highness, um, which also in, in um, 
which also included the involvement of His Majesty. And as we know, as a uh, people work in museum, there were E numbers in our case with attached to it. And in this case, His Majesty said in order for them to be returned and, and buried, they needed to be bestowed names. And um, they were then bestowed the names of Palu Atta and uh, Tupo Atta. Um, when I was discussing with Teresi about uh, this presentation, mine was supposed to be uh, next week, and I've just come off the back of leave, and she said maybe play the, the news piece um, by ABC, which kind of provides a bit of a background for it. So if you bear with me, I'll just play this uh, for you, and, um, and then I'll continue on our presentation. Can I just check? Are you hearing the audio? Uh, no, I think no, when okay. you share, just click the sound option. Oh. Maybe you can unshare and go back on that uh, button that the uh, for that Zoom always give you as an option. So when you share screen, there's a, a button for sound. You click it. Share. And then there's okay, a- Okay, gotcha. Yes. yes. Okay. Apologies. No worries. A royal working? homecoming for two Tongan males, over 150 years after they died. We know little about their lives, but Australians took their remains and put them in a Sydney Museum collection. Now the final chapter, repatriation to their present-day ancestors, where they have been laid to rest with dignity. Why it's important to me is that this is our national treasure. This is our inheritance. The two ancestors originated from the islands of Atta in the far south of the kingdom of Tonga. Palu and Tupo Atta are the names posthumously bestowed to them by King Tupo VI. Bestowing names to the dead is not customary in Tonga, but this is a momentous occasion. It's a very, very sensitive, uh, uh, a very happy occasion. At the same time, it allows us to look back. The history of the Atta Islanders is a tragic one. They were renowned for their impressive physique and the ease with which they were able to scale the island's steep cliffs. And I think this is one of the reasons why they were actually uh, taken overseas and retained and looked upon scientifically. In 1863, an Australian whaler from Tasmania arrived on the island and tricked half of the island's 350 residents on board and took them to Peru to sell them into the slave trade. Horrified by what took place, King Tupo I transferred the remaining islanders to his palace grounds before permanently resettling them on Ewa Island. The descendants of Atta Islands are now living here in Golomaile, the small village behind me. The atrocities of 1863 saw the communities being torn apart, which is still remembered by the descendants living here. They have been eagerly awaiting the return of Tupo and Palu Atta, as has the royal family who are out here in numbers to pay their respects to the two ancestors. The king, along with Queen Nanaspau and Princess Latu Fuibeka, were present for the service and were visibly emotional. Today, with the presence of the king, he's actually rejuvenated that long traditional uh, ancestry that they've had. The royal palace of Tonga plays a central role in this repatriation. For a leader, it's a must for them, you know. You have to, to bury your mom. You have to bury your dead. You can't throw it away. Symbol as that. 
Little is known about Tupo and Paluata, but records at the Australian Museum have confirmed their provenance. So both ancestors came in at separate times and they were both donations to the Australian Museum. One was donated over 150 years ago, we believe was picked up here in Tonga by a surgeon and then taken back to Australia. And we believe the other one was picked up by an artist and the ancestor ended up in a Pacific art collection in Sydney and then was donated to the Australian Museum. The Australian Museum has been prioritising the repatriation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders remain in recent years and now they're looking to replicate the efforts in the Pacific. Ancestral remains were taken without permission and without consent and taken into museums for their collections. And so it's highly important that those ancestral remains are returned to their communities so that they can have their burial rights. Repatriation is a very big topic right now in Australia and finding out how we can do this properly was part of, um, was part of the process um, because it enables us to put some practices in place so that we can do that with the other ancestors we hold throughout the Pacific. For the descendants of Palu and Tupo, there's a feeling of closure having the remains returned to the island. We can now live together and this brings closure within ourselves, in our community, in this island. So um, as you saw there, that, that the what took place, and um, we were very um, fortunate that we, um, His Majesty had assigned a royal undertaker, Matapule, um, which was Haukoloa, and he came in December to properly prepare both ancestors, the Boata and Baluata. Um, to be placed in boxes and in holding um, before, and then he returned back in January to accompany um, the ancestors along with, as you can see, their community members, uh, staff from the Australian Museum and Australian Government um, in repatriating Baluata and Boata to Tonga. It was a very moving, um, you know, very moving ceremony. Um, upon arrival, um, we had um, we had uh, hired a a boat, as in the Australian Museum had hired a boat to be able to take uh, the uh, community members uh, from Tongatapu to Eua. Um, the reason why, as mentioned in the in the news piece, uh, the people from Atta were relocated by His Majesty King George the the First. Um, to the island of Ewa and the resting place in Golomaile was um, where these ancestors uh, or the descendants now live. So the Australian Museum, um, you know, after consulting with the with the palace office, uh, consulting with the, the government, the High Commissioner, Tongan High Commissioner here, um, and other knowledge holders and, and um, on the best way forward and how we could do this respectfully, um, you know, we were uh, sort of given these these opportunities to support this work and, and return them. So um, there were two boats that left from Tongatapu, um, one being the Navy um, Boya Latte and um, and another ferry which ferried across um, the community members and others who were part of the um, the ceremony. Um, and upon arrival in Ewa, we were escorted up to the, the cemetery and um, we awaited His Majesty's arrival and uh, of course the arrival of um, the Boata and Baluata, handled by um, the undertakers. So you can see how Koloa in the photo there, but the the royal undertaker is uh, Lawaki, and he was there um, giving instructions how everything should take place. And um, you know, it was as I mentioned, it was a beautiful ceremony, um, burying them in uh, Laura's speech as uh, she. Um, apologize to the people of Tonga, to the, His Majesty and the people of Tonga about the Australian Museum's past practices in collecting um, and assured them that um, with this new division and um, more of us First Nations and Pacifica people in these spaces, we would be um, 
working to rectify and make right um, what we can. Uh, of course, you know, engaging and with the support of uh, the various Pacific nations, in this instance, Tonga. And um, so it was, as I mentioned, we had people from, uh, I think, the whole of Iwa attended this, actually, and um, the burial uh, took place, and we were able to pay our respects and meet um, uh, their majesties. Um, and, you know, all of this, um, you know, it did come off the back of um, really trying to um, engage in a way where we are, you know, truly listening and preferring, preferring um, how the Tongan government, the Tongan community, the people of Atta, um, the, you know, the royal family wanted us um, to conduct this repatriation. So it was a special one that it took a, a large team and a lot of support um, from the royal family, the palace office, the high commissioner and other knowledge holders. And, you know, also the people of, uh, of Atta, the descendants of Atta. And, you know, hearing their stories, understanding that yes, this was a repatriation and it was a moving occasion, but it did also, um, you know, uh, bring in and open up, um, you know, a lot of painful paths for them, um, especially with regards to, to um, blackbirding. Um, and, sorry, um, and yeah, so our conversations continue. Um, we have about 394, 95 um, Pacific ancestors that are, that are in our care. And as I mentioned, we, the Australian Museum is committed in um, obtaining the support and the resources we need to engage properly um, and be able to, to repatriate uh, these ancestors so that they are returned to their um, respective homelands and, and buried there. I think that's it, uh, Tarisi. Pito uh, Melissa for you know shedding uh, more light into um, the whole process of uh, repatriation uh, that you participated in as you mentioned it's uh, the first one yeah for um, the Australian Museum to talk yeah the first one right now um we under this division. Under this division. Also, yeah, under this this division. But it, it does seem it is the first to, to Tonga. Wow. Wonderful. No, thank you for you know for sharing that. And it's good to hear it from someone um, you know, that was involved in you know the whole process of repatriation. Maybe I'll open it up to our uh, listeners, uh, for uh, listening to Melissa today. If you have any uh, questions or comments to her presentation, I'll open it up to you now. Yeah, you can just unmute um, yourself and there's a star's comment there, Naka star. Looking at the chat here. Ah, okay. Oh, yeah, no worries. So her mic is not working, but she's acknowledging uh, you, Melissa, um, uh, especially were you with them at the Auckland Museum recently, Melissa? No? I was with our repetition colleagues at Auckland Museum. I must have read it differently. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ma Star, uh, for your comment. Really appreciate it. Okay, and uh, you have to meet Star Melissa because she's uh, your, I think, counterpart in Aotearoa. Uh, I think Erica has uh, her hand up. Go, Erica, Vinaka. Just curious about. Um, oh, sorry. Hi, my name's Erica Radawag, and I work at the Jean P. Hayden Museum in American Samoa. Um, I was curious about. The person who ended up in the arts collection, how I do, do you have any background? Was there any background or information on how 
the one the one repatriated person ended up in an arts collection i generally we know that they that people are taken and end up in medical collections or scientific collections and this is really one of the first times i've i've heard of did i got that correct that it was an arts collection it was an artist who collected okay okay so okay sorry Okay. Yeah. So it was an Further artist clear. who collected one of them. Okay. Um, did just to have them in their possession. I'm sorry. I'm not. Ex I'm not asking that. I'm just. Yep. So what? I'm what just we kind of floored by, by, I just kind of floored by, people collecting people in a. I feel that's more like you know, we've been presented for so long for scientific purpose and medical purpose, but for private collection, I just have no words. <laughs> Sorry. I think that's about it, I guess. Yeah. Likewise, so our records show that it was an artist who collected uh, one of the ancestors. Um, so it wasn't in, as an art collection, but one of the art, uh, an artist collected um in this instance, what we, we've we named him Baluata, and then um, he was then donated to the Australian Museum. And if I can just uh, quickly add to Erica's uh, comment, eh? you know, you mentioned one was collected by a surgeon, and then there was a period of time, and then collected by an artist. Um, how did they end up together? I'm just curious, you know, they were collected by two different people. Did you find out anything in the provenance research, Melissa? So they were, um, as in, they ended up together in the Australian Museum, donated at different times by different people, and they ended up in, in the Australian Museum's collection. And I mean, if you think about it, eh, it's uh, sometimes we say, you know, it's meant to be that they be together. Uh, you know, it's quite moving uh, as well. You know, they both didn't know, you know, that what will happen to them. Uh, but I know the island of Atta, as you mentioned, yeah, uh, about blackbirding. Um, so that was very common back then, uh, Melissa, for, you know, boats just to come in and, and take take people. That's a big amount of people, 350 islanders to be taken all the way to Peru. Yeah, so there, there was actually 300 uh plus of 350, 60 um, people living on Atta, around 144 of them were, um, according to sort of the research and, and books that are written, were then taken from Atta. So it only happened between two years, 1862 and 64. Um, but in 1863, and you know, as this uh, unfolded, we managed to have conversations with uh, some people in Tonga who had said they're descendants of the person who was on the boat, who, you know, who went to Tonga to relay what was happening. And then his Majesty King George the Paul I then relocated them to Iowa to be closer to the main island. Um, as you saw in the news piece, Atta is quite far away from any other island. And um, when, so they were brought over to Iowa, he was afraid that um, that these blackbirders would uh, come back and steal the rest of the people. Wow. Well, thank you, Melissa, for sharing that, because I know in the Pacific, you know, we have similar situations in Tokelau, and I also know in Fiji, um, it was the island of Rotuma. Uh, I can tell that Ata, Rotuma, and Tokelau, they have something in common, yeah? Isolation, right? And so they were easy targets, right, by this... Uh, but these black birders, and I understand if I know these Rotumans who will be listening in too, uh, we know that many of them ended up in uh, the Torres Strait uh, Islands in Australia. Um, and they were also very, I think, well known and uh, in demand because of their diving skills. Um, you know, so that 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 was amazing yeah, to hear, you know, why what the, the purpose and the reason why they were taken. And thank you, Melissa, for you know, bringing this story to life for us. I really appreciate it. Ruby has a hand up. Thank you, Ruby. 
Um, my little lover, Melissa, thank you so much for that beautiful uh, presentation and to share um, an emotional journey of returning, you know, your ancestors to to Tonga. And, um, you know, I just, while it's all, there's a lot of trauma and pain in that, I'm so happy to see, um, you know, um, that the ancestors in the Tong communities are able to reach that point of to begin to heal. So, um, malo lava, malo al pito. Um, I, I had a question, uh, but I think first I just want to maybe add my two cents to what Erica has brought up. It's just something that I remembered from when I, um, my time when I was, you know, research researching provenance, I recall that lots of these artists or scientists or um, medical professionals, they they'll be like there's like a network of them, and sometimes they'll be in different parts of the world, but they've got somebody in New Zealand that they, you know, that want to collect these human remains, and so yeah, it is a bit weird to be thinking why is an artist collect, <laughs> collecting human remains but um I do recall like there's, there's these networks there these trades you know that take that has taken place a lot during that time and so maybe the artist had a friend who was um you know that wanted um human remains for whatever um that was for so that could be that's just some of the one of the many crazy things that I've come across <laughs> as to why our human, our, our ancestors were being collected. Um, so it's just like my little <laughs> two cents to that. Um, and um, one of the questions I wanted to ask uh, Melissa is, did you, were there any like, like challenges um through the whole repatriation process because I loved how the um the the Tongan royal family were completely behind this and I think there's nothing <laughs> it's nothing better to yeah that, yeah to have all that support surrounding this um process uh but yeah I wonder if there were any like um issues in in the institution or in the community that um. Be, yeah, just something I was just curious about. Thank you. Thanks for your um, Ruby, and thanks for the question. Um, I think as as any project, you will have sort of you know different challenges faced. I think the biggest thing for us is we are a new division, um, and uh, we don't necessarily have uh, sort of backing of doing this, and so we were starting from scratch and really engaging. Um, just having really authentic conversations with the, uh, you know, with the Tongan people on what we could and couldn't do. Um, finances, of course, is always a big issue. And for us wanting to honor, um, you know, our part in repatriating them, carrying the costs, you know, the cultural costs of, you know, what needed to be done um, and the repatriation costs is, was something we had to really, um, you know, but we were lucky uh, that our director, you know, and we get funding from the Commonwealth for First Nations, we sit under there and we were very lucky that we, they were able to help and support that. So, you know, that it was something, um, you know, that was a challenge, but, uh, you know, we were able to to negotiate things and have that, uh, you know, and, and properly do it, you know, we and really properly carry out and honor them in a proper tongue and, you know, uh, uh, like sort of a tongue and wake here and having the koloa, having the gifts, um, you know, presented to when you approach the royal family, there is, a, there is a protocol that needs to be followed. So there's all these different things, I think, that in a, from a Western language, you really don't understand. And so challenges are really just trying to explain this, break it down um, on, on why these need to be done um, and, um, you know, carrying the costs of uh, bringing people over, repatriating back, uh, taking people over to Ewa. Um, so th these are some challenges. Um, we were fortunate, and, and, and I don't take this lightly because I do know that it won't be the same with any other Pacific Island that the royal family 
you know, we had their support on this. And uh, if you are Tongan, you know, and the royal family gives the go ahead and, and, and helps with the arrangement, things are much smoother. So I don't take that lightly. And I am I am very aware of, um, you know, of our privilege in that sense to, to do that. And I think the real work will start um, now that we've got the learnings from that and, um, you know, embarking with the engagement with other Pacific nations um, to, to repatriate our, our ancestors back. To their you know respective places does that answer your question <laughs> yes thank you melissa uh, that's that's amazing thank you for that uh, question ruby uh, and also melissa for your answer because i know um i think you mentioned hey, it's not to be taken lightly and what a privilege uh, to have the royal family backing the whole process. I was going to ask you, like, how did that process work for you? Uh, I'm sure through your connections uh, as well, Melissa, did it uh, uh, help you to have your already created connection that helped everything work for you and the team? Yeah, so with our engagement a sort of strategy, it it helped in various ways. It did it did help that we had a member on our team who had, you know, close relations with um, her royal highness. Uh, but it also started way before the conversation about repatriation. So we we engaged. We found out, you know, who's the best person we could talk to, and then we embarked on smaller projects. So um, last year we opened up a new Pacific Gallery um, once on one, and um, you know, we went to our Tongan community for, to, for storytelling and, you know, um, you know, telling Tongan stories. So it really did, it started in building that. And then um, we hold, and last year we unfurled what we think is probably the largest Ngatu. Um, I, I can be corrected. Um, but it took up, uh, we had to really lease uh, or hire four basketball courts and it took up about three basketball courts, um, just the width and, and length of, of this Ngatu. And so there were all these different engagements, little projects along the way that really did build up that that trust. It did show the Tongan community that, you know, we were going to, they gave us the opportunity to go to them to seek advice and, and really just really, build that relationship and that trust. So there were all these different projects along the way that really did lead up to the conversation of, of, of repatriation and the work that went on. So, you know, repatriation was really a result of, of a lot of other projects and engagements and consultations that we had had for other things. That's amazing. Yeah, that makes us uh, uh, appreciate yeah, those uh, engagements are sort of like investments, yeah? Uh, at different points, and then it, you know, came to fruition where everything, you know, went smoothly. Uh, my other question I had for you, Melissa, before anybody else uh, would like to chime in, and also Star, you can type in your question too, um, was the welcome from the host community uh, on the island of Ehua, how did that, uh, how was it like, uh, Melissa, when uh, you all arrived? Um, it was definitely a very, very moving um, ceremony. Uh, the welcome there, we were greeted at the wharf by members of the community and members from the palace office. So it was very, um, you know, we received a very wonderful um, uh, welcoming. We were escorted up uh, to the, the cemetery. And, you know, I think just just excitement and sadness, if I can use that in the same uh, context all around, um, you know, as I mentioned specifically because of the history of the people of Akta. And um, I think, you know, as Pacific Islanders, uh, you know, we are a happy people. And sometimes when we have our challenges, my own opinion, uh, uh, challenges and there's hurtful topics, it's just something that we kind of brush over, we don't really delve into. So as, you know, for the people of Akta, it was something that was carried down, their stories were carried down through each other, but it wasn't really widely known. We, you know, we, we found out, you know, a lot of people were only just finding out about the black burning that took um, place on Atta and you know one of the me members of the Atta community that we went with is a bishop in one of the um, uh, denominations here and you know he said you know he can he can remember uh, or you know he was telling the story of his great grandfather you know carrying a chicken and a bunch of bananas 
um, to go in exchange for one nail and then never coming back. You know, so just just the stories as such, um, you know, we were very privileged to to hear. And, um, you know, so it was number one, it was a very big um, welcoming in the fact that, you know, we were returning uh, Tongans to be buried in Tongan soil, um, you know, and with with the blessing, of course, in support of the royal family. And then for the people of Kolomaile, Kolomaile is the village in Ewa, which is named after the village in, in Atta, where they had uh, come from. And um, for them, it was it was just remembering their ancestors who were who were stolen as slaves. So it was, you know, kind of twofold the uh, I guess the, the feeling on the day, but um, all in all, I think there was a lot of, of pride and, uh, and joy. And after they were returned, um, you know, the people of Atta, uh, the families of Atta had all, and Kolomaile had prepared a, a big uh, presentation to his majesty. So after the burial, there was a presentation to thank his majesty for the support and bringing back their um, ancestors to be buried there. So, you know, it was it, it very, you know, very hard to describe, but there was there was a lot of tears. There was a lot of excitement, a lot of pride. Um, and, you know, we were very, very privileged um, to be part of, of the ceremonies, the Talano and, 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 you know, the celebration afterwards. That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much, Melissa, uh, for, you know, for sharing that, because I know eh, how the community, um, you know, will feel, as you're saying, you know, can be kind of bittersweet, as you can say, the whole excitement, but also that feeling of sadness. But I think all of us here in this room uh, will understand that repatriation, you know, contributes to healing yeah, uh, in our community and to remember, you know, those who have gone before us. Um, I th I'm just looking at the time. We have about another eight minutes. Anyone else have a, uh, any other comments before I give it back to Melissa to uh, conclude our talano. I saw Ruby's hand go up. Go, Ruby. Okay. Um, I was just thinking, uh, I'm just remembering how uh, uh, the, uh, in Otago University, they have over 100, I think around 121 um, Tongan ancestors in their was just um med what is it anthropology museum in their medical school, um and that's I don't know if you're familiar with um ha um Hallie Buckley, um she's a long time bi um bioarchaeologist or anthropologist at um Otago University, and she had just facilitated a repatriation to the Cook Islands um of some ancestors. So um yes, I I was just wondering if there's I was just thinking how great it would be if there was some kind of Pacific network, <laughs> um one where all museums are kind of involved in so we can like talk to each other about um the, the different collections that we hold, um and how we can, you know, get that momentum going for um returning our ancestors to their homeland. So I know that's another uh, big one <laughs> um, that I would love to see um, happen. Um, from my last conversation with them, they were just waiting on the okay from the Tongan community or um, the royal family. And I, they might be like trying to work with their communities in Dunedin, but um, yeah, I'm just, I, I just, imagining you know the repatriation of um that a lot of human um, ancestors in Dunedin and how um incredible that would be and yeah just like I don't know if there can be some some kind of um way that we will keep in touch um uh for our Pacific um ancestors okay yeah, that's me yeah I think that's a great idea Ruby I know that we are trying to have conversations here at the museums here in Australia to have similar conversations. Um, uh, but I think, you know, uh, wider conversations with other museums who hold specific uh, remains and ancestors. Uh, I, I think, yeah, why hasn't it happened already? Yeah. 
That's absolutely right. And I think, uh, um, thank you for bringing that point up because Dr. Mary Sovic, um, she's based in Washington. Um, she's also been working with the team at the Queensland Museum uh, because of the ancestral remains that are in the Queensland Museum collections that connects back to the black birding uh, time for our brothers and sisters from Melanesia uh, to Vanuatu. Um, and so that's also ongoing. And ABC um, has been running uh, sort of a series of uh, Talanoa on their program. Uh, maybe I think what you've mentioned, Ruby, um, it'll be just great just to, you know, connect everything that is working so far, like in Australia, I think STAR has got the network going in New Zealand. And I think through PIMA, uh, the Pacific Island Museum Association, you know, just to string all of this together, yeah, and get this network going. Uh, maybe that can be a, a result of this uh, series of webinar that we've just started now. That can be a lovely outcome. What do you think, uh, ladies? <laughs> yeah, that's the way to go. Eh? So, because we already have um, the people, so to speak, you know, who are here right now, and there's a few others connecting in online. And um, maybe for connecting into what Ruby just mentioned, uh, in the next few weeks, we'll be here in Honolulu for the Festival of Pacific Arts. And there's going to be a symposium. And one of the section of the symposium is going to be on museums. And repatriation is going to be included in it. So hopefully uh, that can be something that can be formalized, uh, you know, at that level and perhaps get some support from the governments who are going to be present at uh, um, the symposium in Honolulu. So I've written it down um, and uh, I will credit this wonderful group over here uh, for, you know, this wonderful presentation by Melissa and how it's feeding off, right? to this discussion and, and connection. And that was something I was saying uh, to a few of my colleagues as a result of these webinars, um, you know, how it's you know, kind of uh, pockets of conversation and actions that is going on all over the world. And my inbox is filling up with people saying, oh, you know, you need to talk to this person, you need to talk to this person. So it's wonderful to see. And we need more of this Talanoa like this. What do you think, Melissa? I 100% agree, and I look forward, I'll be in at FESPAC too, so I look forward to, um, yeah, being part or listening into that conversation that'll take place around it. I think it is very important, and you're right. Um, you know, it needs to be heard by, you know, the, the heads of government um, from across the Pacific at that level, so great idea. Yeah, especially what you've just shared today, Melissa, you know, the reputation to Tonga, it involves, um, you know, a lot of time um people's uh, energy and also money yeah because the funding issues always comes up who's gonna pay um and so if we get the buy-in of the government then when a request comes in you know everyone won't be surprised uh maybe the relevant ministers uh who are going to be present in honolulu can be able to take it back uh, to the individual country so that they can be able to support the local museum so yeah so something to look forward to yeah, something to look forward to. Yes, Melissa Vinakavaka level from all of us. I have a long list of questions, but I know I'll meet you in uh, in Honolulu, so we can uh, maybe sit on uh, at Waikiki Beach uh, and have a chat. <laughs> and I look discuss, forward to it. <laughs> and discuss a little bit more. So maybe before we uh, finish out, Alano and Star is clapping from her desk in Auckland. Thank you, Star. Uh, thank you so much, Erica, for logging in from uh, uh, Pango Pango and American Samoa, and uh, Ruby here logging in from um, uh, Vienna uh, in Europe. So, Melissa, I'll give, it, I'll give this time back to you if you have any concluding remarks or a word of encouragement for us and those who will listen to this recording later on uh, in the discussion about the importance uh, of repatriation and how important it is also for our communities to understand what happens behind the scene. And I think that's also a reason why I wanted to have these types of webinars so that uh, we're not talking to the converted, right? We are also sharing to our community so that they understand what is repatriation? What do those people do in that museum? Yeah, and and because all these questions, right, come from them. So your word of, or your word of advice, Melissa, over to you. 
Uh, thank you, Tarisi. Um, I think I, I did mention it as I spoke that we were very fortunate and privileged that we did have um, you know the support of the the Tongan royal family for this repatriation. We've we, you know we have had conversations with um, other ancestors that we hold, and you know and I I acknowledge um, that it is a difficult conversation number one, um, and that different people have different opinions, um, you know around it, and that um, you know it can be very. Um, it can be very tough sometimes to have these conversations, uh, which is why we kind of developed that that uh, the engagement strategy where we kind of engage on different levels and different projects before actually approaching this one, which, you know, as we know in Pacific, in our Pacific cultures, you know, a death, a funeral, it, it's very important business, to, you know, to us. And so approaching and having that conversation, we did it and we tried to do it off the back of establishing, you know, these, these trusts. I know that I am preaching to sort of the choir here in the sense that I know this is just, you know, normal practice. We do in Pacific communities before we discuss. So th that was very important. And, you know, sometimes we have, why don't you just return it and all of that, um, you know, especially coming from, from, from our own Pacific uh, community members and that. Um, but I, I guess just um, helping to understand um, the different layers of what needs to take place for it to happen, the different people who kind of have to have input, um, you know, in these conversations. And of course, as you as you mentioned, um, you know, especially in Australia, we are only a small part of of um, you know of our population here. Um, at first, uh, we do sit under First Nations uh, division, and rightfully so, um, you know addressing repatriation and, you know, and the government throwing support behind repatriation um, for First Nations Aboriginal people, um, you know, will 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 be important because we do live here and reside here in, in, in Australia upon their lands. And so I guess, you know, a, a bit of understanding on the situations, it's not that we are, are not doing anything about it, um, but we do, you know, we are working to have the right conversations, understand, you know, the different tapus, the different um, uh, expectations, um, so that we are able, as part of, you know, we did speak about sort of the healing that comes, um, you know, alongside with that, as part of that having, you know, being able to return respectfully and culturally appropriately, um, you know, these ancestors and do what we can into writing, um, you know, the wrong. And, you know, as I said, our, our, our director did mention and acknowledged, um, you know, museum, our Australian Museum collecting practices in the past, which we are very determined, you know, from our CEO, you know, Kim McKay, all, all levels of our, um, of the organization are just really trying to do right. And so I guess, you know, we ask for a bit of, of patience and understanding as we navigate our way. And if you have any feedback and, and you've got any ideas on that, you know, I know for us, we're very open, you know, we're very open to, to hearing that. And we just want to do better. Um, and we can't do that in silo, I believe. We need, um, you know, we need the support, we need the input and, and communication and at the Talano with our communities and, and others who, who do this well and who have, um, you know, have have established some, some best practices uh, around it. Um, I think it's a good idea for us to all sort of have that conversation because at the end of the day, it's not, we're not doing this, um, you know, so that you'll, put our museum on the map, but we're doing this as people of Pacifica um, because it's the right thing to do for our communities. Melissa, um, your, your words just reminded me of what happened last week when uh, McMichael Mutok, our speaker from Palau, uh, also was speaking, uh, just like you today. Um, and uh, immediately from uh, after his uh, speech, uh, he had uh, a message uh, from his um, colleagues from the Marshall Islands. They were attending a meeting in Geneva, in Switzerland, and uh, they saw that he was speaking here, and they also met in Taiwan previously. But because Palau has just activated the first ever uh, repatriation from Germany, the team from Switzerland, instead of flying back to Marshall Islands directly, they went to Germany 
and yesterday they were in the storeroom looking at the ancestors of our brothers and sisters from the Marshall Islands. So to me, what you just share, shared, you know, really signifies the importance of this network, uh, that when we share, uh, when we genuinely, uh, you know, connect with people and a community, amazing things happen. Um, so we're seeing amazing things happen there in Tonga, in Hawaii, in Aotearoa, when you'll hear this next week, and Palau just happened in March, and now Marshall Islands is processing there. So I think, uh, Ruby, uh, the challenge has been accepted <laughs> for a network that has to happen. Yeah, Melissa? So for all of you, Erica, Star, uh, Ruby, you'll get an email from me very shortly, um, you know, and I can see that most of us women are in this space and also we acknowledge our male counterpart, but, you know, we are doers and we are movers and we are shakers, we can make it happen. And so it's amazing how we can uh, collaborate, yeah, and just work together. And the example of Tonga is just, you know, a, a wonderful template, as I, if I can use that word, eh? that if it can happen to Tonga, Samoa is next, and who else is next after that? Eh? So on that note, Melissa, I know it's uh, still what breakfast time there for you, my sister. Um, thank you so much for you know taking the time from your busy schedule. I know you're still on leave, and uh, we really want to say Vinakavakalevu uh, Malo for sharing your amazing experience with us. You're doing such an amazing work, my sister. Uh, at the Australian Museum. Uh, we're very proud of you. And uh, definitely we will see you in Hawaii. And I bid you goodbye. Uh, thank you so much, Erica. Thank you, Star. And everybody else who's listening online. We all take care. Bye. Good night. Bye. Thank you so much uh, to everyone for uh, listening in to this uh, fourth webinar. Hello, uh, Mabuhai, Dr. Anna Labrador, uh, connecting in from New York. Thank you so much for listening in to this uh, special Talanoa. And uh, we're so happy that we are celebrating the um, American... Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. So this webinar of five, I better put the other one down, it's not 10, it's five, <laughs> um, is organized to specifically celebrate our stories. Yeah? So we want to say, Vinakabakalevu to Melissa Malu, Malo Aupito, Vinakabakalevu. She's from Lakemba in Lao, and her mom is from Tonga. So we just want to say, Vinaka, Vinakabakalevu, Melissa, for sharing your Tonga story. Now we have one more coming up, uh, last one for the month. Next week will be uh, Dr. Tehiri Keke Herwini. He will be connecting in from Aotearoa in New Zealand. So same time, five o'clock next week. It'll be five o'clock US time. So it'll be 12 midday in Fiji and New Zealand next Thursday. So it's our Wednesday, your Thursday. So for those of you who are connecting in via my Talano with Dr. T Facebook page, Vinakabakalevu Sara for listening in. Serena Chant, Fulori Monomono, Stino Manumanu Nivalu, M. Lele Tonga, Veniana Bukot, Vinakabakalevu Sara, Bubalina Bonromo, Bubalina Nitenge, Bubalina Raibuni, Bubalina Nasara, Vinakabakalevu Sara, Nasia Matiku Mainiku, Almeid Bulai, um, Bulubunaka Tupo, Alumita Sesenam Barani, Mitelin Rungu, Ulamila Kei Wate Ulingala, wherever we live in Akasara, we came together and I said, but to my sick Vinaka de Kua, and I'm not the maybe it was a tick when I saw Ulu Tangabango, eh? Live we came near the Tarong to the Mother of the Kavichukana Museum. We came in the Rakanaval near Maroy, eh? Go on and Donna Tambana of Wingaram to Kina, so we came near Reddit to Nukachiko Michamani, and Nabulo Machi, and Sarangana Kenalaki Maroy, Mekoli Stali Palau, Nangondra, now a Kadame Palau, Kakao, and Angona, I will take it to Kina, or Chamani, and Nabonua, or Palau. 
o va venir a ser que va a levo a ver que viene en un libro político en la que toma en la vital no go y honolulu en la mada tolmingo en la que tiene la festival pacificados eh honolulu carna mai vos tico que no era vi ministra ni no anda bula va que toque so ministers of cultures uh, all over the Pacific, and I'm going to go to Honolulu. I'm going to go to Honolulu, and I'm going to go to Honolulu, and I'm going to go to Honolulu, Mengan Revi kini na Vito kau ni mabir na maten tu Rosang Vulkan na maten tu na Pasifika. Belat ini sarangan Revi merak kau mai na yango ni tamata. Oiran na non tangkasi kau baka iloa mai na non tapi yang ni anu karena kini Vito and the museum and the se borbor ni kua. Entah rumah tu ni talan no mai na Australia museum mai Sydney. Kata kata cik no Melissa Malu and anu orang tu kau terua na turanga. Rosa Kolistale Kina yon yon no ewa Roturang ni ata O tupo ata ke palu ata Wabi di binak bali Vike mni Na nam nibito Kwa ni tuko mai Ni kalau nga tetiko Dan angai sota tali Ka kuni kwa lezaba Na madha tal minggo Lotu lemu Tin korun laka loko Enda la sota tali kina Ni na mai wakum madha latiko Na nanda tokani Main ni sulandi O dokta te hira ke ke heroini Na nungu i tokani Kero do Vinga rabi wata Na tambana ngo Nak balik lewo, ni kalau ngah tertiko, sabak kemudian ni, ni mesti tangkap.